Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Additional Dwelling Supplement webinar. My name is Isabel Demerno. I'm Head of Corporate Tax and Incentives here at Brodie's, and my colleague Bob Langridge um, will also be uh, participating in a moment. So to start off with the basics, um, one of the problems about ADS is that there are many misconceptions about it. Even in the way it's described by the government, um, we think is a, a potential misconception because oh, that's not really it's what it's about. So it is not just a tax on second homes. In fact, it's not just about homes at all. If a non-individual is buying a dwelling, for example, there will always be ADS, unless there's a relief. Um, also, it's not just about second homes in the sense that it can apply to your first home if you own some other kind of property that isn't a home. Um, moving on, it can apply if you yourself only own one home, but somebody connected with you owns another residential property. Um, one of the problems that sometimes emerges is that uh, ADS, the Scottish 3% supplement, is quite different from the 3% that applies to SDLT. But there are lots of newspaper articles about um, the SDLT, obviously, and clients sometimes read these and get the wrong idea about how it works in Scotland. One of the big differences is that the ADS applies to the purchase of mixed property, i.e. Um, a purchase of residential and non-residential property. So um, the garage with a flat above on that kind of thing. The ADS will apply to the dwellings element of that purchase, even if you're paying LBTT at a mixed rate, i.e. at the non-residential rate on the whole thing. And you've actually got to look through and identify the price portion to the dwellings in the mixed purchase. Um, the other problem is that for multiple buyers, it's a kind of all or nothing situation. If one buyer is caught by the ADS, they'll all be caught. So a lot of these things are a bit unexpected. Going back to the non-natural persons, i.e. companies and things like that, ADS is always payable, even if they're only buying one of them, even if they're only buying one dwelling. So ADS is always payable by companies, some trusts, individuals buying in the course of business. And this is sometimes unexpected, not least because it talks about the um, tax on second homes, but for companies and so on, it is always payable. Unless, of course, there's some other relief like the six plus relief. Um, because if you buy six or more dwellings as part of a single transaction, there's no ADS. Now, the trusts um, are complex, and Bob has uh, designed a cunning slide to explain how it all works. <laughs> so, yes, ADS um, and LBTT kind of have their own theories of, of trusts and how trusts work compared to... Uh, the rest of, of UK tax law and, and trust law, and the two don't really intermingle at all. Um, but if you look at this slide at the top, we have um, a traditionally pale male and stale trustee who, in any kind of trust arrangement, is going to be the legal owner of, of, of a property. And then the question as to how ADS and LBTT applies to any kind of trust arrangement is really going to depend on the rights of specific beneficiaries under those trust arrangements. So if we start from the, the left-hand side, um, this shouldn't really be a surprise to anyone, where we have uh, an absolute entitlement, i.e. a bare trust arrangement, where the beneficiary is absolutely entitled against the trustee to call for a conveyance of the property, then the beneficiary, this happy gentleman in the pith helmet, he's the person that we treat as buying the property for the purposes of ADS. So the individual's kind of rules will apply when we're looking to see how the ADS washes out. 
and also it will be the liability of the beneficiary to actually pay any tax. Moving further over to the left, um, where we have trusts where the beneficiary either has a sort of traditional proper, well, not a proper life rent, but a, a life rent in the form of an interest in possession, um, or indeed has some sort of lesser right to occupy the property or receive income held in the trust, then again, we treat for ADS purposes the beneficiary as being the buyer. So we're into the individual's rules there. But when it comes to liability to pay the tax, that is a liability of the trustees rather than the individual's. And then finally, on the right-hand side, we basically have every other kind of trust. So trusts which are wholly discretionary or, say, an accumulation and maintenance trust. And in those cases, we treat the actual trustee in their capacity as trustee and not as an individual as the buyer for ADS and LTT purposes. And what that means is that those trusts, uh, which are outlined in the red box, you are into the non-individual rules, so ADS is always due, and it will be the trustee's liability to account for it. Um, from here on out, however, when we are talking about relevant trusts, what we are talking about are those three kind of trusts on the left-hand side, bare trusts, uh, entitlements to occupy or receive income, or interest in possession trusts. So anything to do with trust is not at all straightforward. Um, and of course, there can be some planning around um, if you have a life rent interest, you know, a right to receive income and whatnot, that can help. So the basic rules for ADS, you have to pay it if the consideration is more than 40K and you or various others, and the various others is um, a quite a complex bit of it, own another dwelling with a value of 40k at the end of the day of purchase and you cannot claim replacement of main residence relief. So the first thing to stress is that on the purchase side of it, we're looking at the consideration for the purchase, but when you're figuring out whether interest in other dwellings or dwellings count against you, i.e. whether they've got to be taken into account, it's the value so it's two different things. One's the consideration, the other is the value. And uh, you don't have to get professional valuations to arrive at that sort of value, but you might have to in some cases where it's particularly significant. If you're buying um, a pro indiviso share, it's the value of the whole dwelling that counts, not the value of your share, and people quite often get tripped up by that. Um, it's important also to, to add, it's not just if you are buying a, a pro indiviso share, but let's say you are buying a property and you own a fifth share of a holiday home, then to work out whether you count that holiday home, you're not looking at the value of one fifth, you're looking at the value of the whole thing. And that obviously comes up a lot where people have inherited interests in uh, properties from grandparents or whatever it is, so they don't um, realize that that little sliver of an interest in a holiday home or whatever um, could actually count against them for buying a much more expensive main residence. Location doesn't matter either. You have to include dwellings both in um, the rest of the UK but also in the rest of the world, and you have to look at interests that are kind of like owning a dwelling in Scotland. So they might not be exactly the same in some other countries, but um, they will count against you. And I think Revenue Scotland haven't actually published much guidance yet about different countries and what kind of interests count against you, but uh, as, as being a, you know ownership of a, of a dwelling, but they will give you an answer if uh, you ask them that question. On the whose other dwellings count against you, um, it's important to note that ADS casts a very, very wide net. Um, and it's very common um, when someone's having an initial discussion with a client buying a property that that client will say, well, I don't own a home, 
Um, but that's not enough to get comfortable that the ADS doesn't apply. You also have to look at property owned firstly by spouses and civil partners of the buyer. And not just spouses and civil partners, but any children, minor children, I should say, of the spouses or civil partners. You also have to look at minor children of the buyer themselves. You have to look at cohabitees of the buyer. That's another big difference between the LBTT ADS and the English 3% charge, which doesn't have a cohabitees rule. Um, in addition to cohabitees, again, it's any minor children of the cohabitees themselves. You also have to look at any relevant trusts, so properties held by the trustee of relevant trusts. And these aren't just trusts for the buyer, but trusts where any of these other individuals who you have to look at are the beneficiaries as well. Um, a lot of these rules kind of work in two directions. The exception to that is you don't look from children up to parents. In, in our experience, the cohabitees rules can often be quite tricky, um, as can the trust rules. For example, if uh, a, a couple have a, effectively a second marriage and one partner owns a dwelling that they may inherited, have inherited from a former spouse, then that can, can catch you out and often trigger the ADS, which is something that people often aren't expecting. So this leads on to kind of the first big practical problem we can often encounter um, in assessing whether a client is going to be liable for the ADS or not. And that's really the level of detail you need to go into when deciding about dwelling ownership with a the, the you own two or more things rule. Um, the list of people whose dwelling ownership is caught is longer than anyone might reasonably imagine. A sort of sensible or reasonable approach to dealing with is probably to have some kind of questionnaire uh, that can be provided to clients as part of the take-on process or a checklist rather than relying on the clients being able to deliver up this information. Um, there's also perhaps a bit of sensitivity there. You know, if you are talking to someone about a relationship, are people just sharing a house or are they living together as if they were spouses or civil partners, which would push them into the cohabitees category. So the next um, condition uh, that we need to look at is the replacement of main residence relief, which Isabel will sort of talk through the basics of. So um, the replacement of main residence relief is kind of recognizing that there shouldn't really be ADS on uh, people buying a main residence, but we couldn't have a blanket relief like that, although it would have made a lot more sense. It would have been very difficult to police. So what we've got is if you're disposing of your previous main residence and buying a new one, then there's no ADS. But there are time limits. So the disposal has to be 18 months before the purchase of the new main residence. And that is a big difference compared to England because for in, in uh, STLT it's 36 months. And in fact, at the minute, you can count disposals going back um, for ages. You have to have used your um, previous property that you're disposing of as a main residence within that 18-month period, although you don't have to have used it all the way through. Um, if you're buying more than one dwelling at a time, you only get the replacement um, of main residence relief on the one that you're going to occupy as your main residence. So if you're buying a house that's got a granny flat or something like that, you're only going to live in one bit of it. So um, that will lead to an ADS charge on the bit that you're not going to live in. Dispose of does not mean sell. You can dispose of the previous main residence by way of gift, for example. And we often see situations where that's actually the best way around it, for example, if you've inherited a sliver of a holiday cottage that's not really worth very much, maybe giving that away um, will um, will count will help you in um, not having more than one residence. But um, equally, with if you're giving if you want to get rid of um, your own main residence and buy a new one, you could dispose of that by way of gift. But 
some of the Revenue Scotland guidance about this is a bit confused. But if you're moving from rented accommodation to a purchased main residence, that's not replacing your main residence. You may, or the clients may think that they are moving house and that they've got a new main residence, but um, it, it doesn't count because you've got to be actually disposing of something that you own. And nor is moving out of your parents' house and buying your first main residence. That's not replacing main residence. One important point, um, just finishing off that prior slide, though, is that nowhere in the legislation does it say that the, the old residence you're disposing of is to be your last main residence, i.e. the last place you lived as a main residence. So you can move, for example, from selling one house that you owned to living in rented accommodation for a year, then buying a new property which you own as your main residence. And in that case, even though arguably that rented flat has been your main residence for a year, you can still look back to the sale of the house you owned and use that to frank a claim for replacement main residence relief. Uh, in, in terms of how the disposals work, there are two sets of rules. Uh, rules where you have an individual buyer and rules where you have a couple buying. And there's kind of an asymmetry here in the way that ADS works, which is, an, again, a bit of a, a misconception. Because although you look at all of these people here on the slide um, to work out whether your client sitting in the middle of this web owns two or more dwellings on a purchase, if it's an individual buyer, you cannot look at all of these people to decide whether there's been a disposal of the main residence. In fact, all you can really look at is the individual themselves, as well as any relevant trusts where that individual was the beneficiary. Um, it's interesting, again, in the rules on relevant trusts, it, it does clearly state that if a trustee disposes of um, a dwelling, that's a disposal. But what it doesn't clearly explain is if an individual renounces their interest in a trust, does that count as a disposal for replacement main residence relief purposes? I, I would be strongly tempted to argue that it does, but neither the guidance nor the legislation is clear on that point. The other track is for couples buying. Um, and to understand how that works, it's important to understand that the couples rules are a new addition to the ADS regime and they are fixing an unforeseen problem with the original rules. So we're going to explain what that problem was and then look at the, the limited fix that the legislation now provides. We used to get an issue which we tend to refer to as the star-crossed lovers problem that would arise when you have a couple where one member of the couple uh, apologies that this is slightly sexist in that we have the husband owning both properties, but one member of the couple is the sole owner of their the main residence that's being replaced. Because what would happen under old ADS is the husband disposes of the existing main residence, and that is treated just as a disposal by the husband and not the wife. Um, because the, those what counts against the buyer rules only apply to acquisitions. Then when they buy their new replacement property, you have to look at each buyer individually, and if they buy in joint names, then the husband, as a buyer, dispose of non-main residence, acquired a new one, therefore he can qualify for the relief. However, the wife has acquired a main residence and not made a disposal of the old one. In this scenario here, you can see on the left, the husband also owns a, a delightful holiday home, and that is deemed to be owned by the wife as well. And therefore, she cannot qualify for replacement main residence relief that is caught by the two plus rules. And because ADS is all or nothing, the entire price of that new house is captured by the ADS. But just to be clear, this is the old rule. This no longer applies. This is the problem that the Scottish Government have now fixed? Have fit now fixed to a certain degree. Under the new Star Crossed Lovers rules, um, that unintended tax charge um, is, is partially limited if your clients can fall into a, a relatively strict set of conditions. First of all, where you have the old main residence being disposed of that's only owned by one of them, 
then they must live together in that own main residence as, as a couple, so either husband and wife or cohabitees or civil partners. Secondly, the new main residence has to be purchased in joint names by the couple and only by the couple. And finally, the couple must intend to live together in that new main residence as a couple. So, But assuming you can get into those um, rules, then there's no ADS. There, there's no ADS. So just running through the same fact pattern again, husband disposes of his dwelling. Um, the original kind of asymmetry is retained here because it's not a disposal by the wife, but when they buy the new house, looking at the husband and wife separately, the husband clearly again falls into the relief, and under the new star cross lover's rules, the wife can benefit from the husband's disposal. So the entire ADS charge is extinguished. These new rules came into force on the 30th of June, and on the 22nd of June this year, they were given retrospective effect. So they apply as if they were in force as at the 1st of April 2016, when the ADS was introduced. Um, Revenue Scotland accept that there may be some purchases out there that were caught by the old star Cross lovers rules and ADS was paid. Um, and if you have one of those clients, it's important to note that that ADS can now be recovered. However, the, the method for doing that is normally going to be making a, a specific reclaim application to Revenue Scotland. Um, there is a standard form available for doing that. We know that some firms have been going back through their records and sort of alerting clients to the possibility of there being a reclaim, so that might be something to consider. So um, when you're trying to decide what is or isn't a main residence, if there are two possible choices, it's really a question of fact or a question of uh, a mixture of various facts. Revenue Scotland say they're going to probably use the same types of tests as are used for determining whether someone's a Scottish taxpayer. So, for example, where do your children live? Where do you um, go to the tennis club or the um, pub quiz or whatever it is? Uh, where, what address is on your bank statements? All this kind of thing. HMRC had a very kind of um, uh, rule of thumb approach to this behind the scenes, which is where does your dog live? Or if you don't have a dog, where would it live if you did have one? Um, and that's just sort of indicating uh, the range of different factors that need to be looked at. Um, but obviously, you have to be prepared for Revenue Scotland looking into this kind of thing if you um, uh, do have a particularly costly purchase um, and, th and they want to be sure that you have properly claim the replacement of main residence relief. So if you buy first and then sell, you have to pay the ADS and then reclaim it. Um, the old property must have been uh, your main residence in the 18 months before, and the old property must be sold within 18 months after. So you pay in first place, but then reclaim. One point to note is that you only have 30 days once you've sold the new property in order to reclaim the ADS. So people can focus on the 18, you know, must sell within 18 months, but having achieved that, forget that there's only 30 days to reclaim it. Um, so some practical issues. Tom and Sally buying their first home together. I think Bob's going to comment on this. Yeah, so these practical issues um, kind of show up how the, the new star-crossed lovers rules, couples buying properties, are only really a partial fix to some of the unfairnesses uh, that we could in, in, encounter still when dealing with couples where one member is the sole owner of the old main residence. Um, with Tom and Sally, they are a kind of traditional couple. Uh, we imagine some of them still exist where they live apart until they're buying uh, a new property and they decide that that new property when they buy it is going to be their joint home. So they're buying it in joint names. They both own their original homes. Tom is selling the flat to help fund the purchase, and Sally, being more sensible and strong-minded, is keeping hers as an investment. In these circumstances, the ADS, unfortunately, is going to be payable um, on that fact pattern. And the reason for that is that 
they don't fall squarely into the conditions for the star-crossed lover's relief. Specifically, they aren't living together in Tom's flat, the main residence being disposed of, together as a couple. Which is a bit of an outrage, really, because we can't really have the tax rules defining how people have got to live their lives. Not everybody wants to live together before they get married, do they? So this is an area where we really need to get the Scottish Government to change the rules and it's on the list of things to try and persuade them about. I think the next one is even worse, and this really should be fixed. Yes, and this is one we've encountered in practice a couple of, of, of times to do with um, you know, complex or, or slow-moving divorce and separa separation arrangements. You know, a hypothetical couple, Trevor and Anne, are separated. They have a family home that, like most people, they own in joint names. Um, and when they separated two years ago, Tom, I mean Trevor, moved out, but he continued to own his share in the house while they finalised the divorce arrangements. When if Trevor wants to buy somewhere else to live in, he is going to pay ADS on these facts because he owns a share in a dwelling worth more than forty thousand pounds, we assume, and so anywhere else that he buys is going to be caught by the two plus rule and he is going to be within the ADS charge. There's no hope for him to recover the ADS charge if ADS is payable either because he's out with the 18 month time limit for disposing of his old main residence because he hasn't lived there for two years. So even if after he buys a new home, he agrees to sell his share to Anne or, or just gift it to her, he's he's not got a recovery available. So that one really needs to be fixed because tax law generally accommodates divorcing and separating couples. The final point there is that um, you can't have more than uh, two people buying the new main residence. Whether that's good or bad from a policy point of view is difficult to say, but it is a fact that you have to be careful of. So finally, um, what is a dwelling actually? So it's a building used or suitable for use as a dwelling or a building that's in the course of construction. And in the course of construction probably means that there are um, not, there is not just a hole in the ground, but some bricks in a hole in the ground or something like that. So construction has actually started, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a building sticking out of the ground. It can't be derelict. And again, it's a question of degree. Um, not, it's not just the fact that the water switched off and could be switched back on again. Um, it needs to be properly derelict before it doesn't count as a dwelling, or does, if that's what you're trying to achieve. Um, it doesn't need a kitchen because you can just eat, don't cook, and some houses are being built with kitchens. It probably does need a toilet, but again, uh, borderline cases depend on a whole bunch of factors like what is the council tax treatment, um, and uh, you know, is the house physically divided into two parts and so on and so forth. Um, if you're buying uh, a, a house with a basement, for example, are you buying more than one dwelling? Um, if it's a basement that could immediately be occupied by a separate family, then it is a second dwelling, but otherwise it isn't. So I hope we've demonstrated that there are quite a lot of well, there's quite a lot more to the ADS than anyone could have possibly imagined. And uh, hopefully, if anyone has any questions that we haven't covered, they might like to send them to us by the Q&A facility. Um, but uh, I think our email addresses are also at the, on the slide at the front. Um, and we'll make them known to you after the seminar as well. So um, if you have particular questions that you want to send us by email, we'd be more than happy to um, try and um, answer them. Well, to answer them, not just to try and answer them. Um, I hope everyone's found the, um, uh, the webinar to be of some help. Uh, it is an annoying tax because I don't think the politicians had any idea what they were getting into when they decided to introduce it, but hopefully the webinar has been of some help. Um, so, as I say, if you have any uh, questions that um, you would like us to answer, then please do send them along.
but otherwise thanks very much for your um, attention and uh, we uh, will be sending out invites to the second in this series of webinars um, which will be about the um, residential S uh, LBTT generally um, but if, you, if there are other areas you would like us to do a webinar on in this field then do let us know. So we've got a question through um, about the ADS um, Sorry, and we just, we just, reclaims. Right. So um, someone is acting for an unmarried couple who currently live in a flat which one of them owns with his parents. They are buying a new home together and ADS will be paid. The intention is to sell flat within 18 months. Will they be able to claim a refund of ADS? Um, I think the answer to that one has to be yes, they will, provided that they are not replicating the ownership of the current flat in the new one. In other words, that the new parents aren't going to be part owners of the new, the new flat house, Or as indeed well. the parents rather than the new parents. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> the same parents, but yeah. It doesn't matter that there's somebody else who's owning the old property. Um, so long as both of the couple are disposing of the old property, uh, sorry, so long as they're living together in the old property and they're buying the new one in joint names, uh, we think that one should be fine. Yeah. Um, but yes, don't let don't let the parents have a share of the the new property is 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 the, the answer for that one. And that obviously comes up a lot with with the, the bank of mum and dad wanting to um, assist with the purchase of. Uh, houses and um, one of the ways people often do that is to take um, t to be involved in taking title because that gives them security whereas what you kind of got to do is just have a loan in order to be able to um, deal with this and it doesn't uh, just, just to, to finalize on that point it doesn't kind of offend against the ADS if, if the parents have a standard security against that loan either uh, which some people do, um, because a security interest is, is just isn't counted for ADS purposes. Yeah. Um, we've we've been asked another question um, at a previous seminar, which was which was about kind of going in the other direction. So, if you have the couple owning um, a house in joint names, uh, which is their main residence, they sell that and buy a new one in the name of just one of them what's the uh, situation there. And that's absolutely fine from the ADS point of view. You know, the person that's buying the new one is replacing the old one, um, and therefore it um, qualifies for the replacement of main residence release. Um, so that one's absolutely fine. Okay, that seems to be all the, the questions for now. So thank you to everyone for attending. And if there are any further questions, as I say, we will be sharing slides around the attendee list. We will have our contact details on them. So do feel free to, to drop us an email with anything else you'd like to ask. Thank you.